Hi, I'm Lisa Bastarash, and I'm from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I'm a data scientist there. So um, I'm really happy to speak to you here today because I see a lot of the people in these rooms as sort of a client of mine. I'm hoping that by doing data science on the EHR, I can provide interesting methods and opportunities for you all to put into the clinic, and it's just an exciting space to work in. So before I start talking about a method that we've developed recently to use um, phenotypes in the EHR to identify um, Mendelian disease gene variants, I want to just give a brief overview of the way I, as a data scientist, see um, what Mendelian disease looks like in the clinic. So if you imagine in a clinical population, there's a certain percentage of patients who actually are affected by a Mendelian disease. And among those, some of them are diagnosed and others are undiagnosed. Among diagnosed patients, you'll see ones like this. This is a patient who's diagnosed with cystic fibrosis and really has the classical manifestations of the disease and has been found to have two copies of Delta 508. But then you also have patients in a clinical population that look like this one. This patient was born with some pretty severe um, problems with hypoglycemia, was later to have found to have failure to thrive and large liver and other features that cause clinicians to think that he may be suffering from a genetic disorder. However, cl typical clinical tests didn't reveal any specific diagnosis. He was actually later th then enrolled into the undiagnosed disease network, at which point he received a whole exome sequence. And that too didn't turn up any known pathogenic variants, um, though it did provide a number of interesting candidate variants that may underlie his disease state. So this patient sort of exemplifies that it's really, oh, my, I think my, oh, my slide isn't cut off. Um, it's really variant knowledge that's limiting the diagnosis of this individual. So, um, and I think that that's true for a portion of people who have Mendelian disease who are not diagnosed. Um, it's because we don't know enough about rare human genetic variants and their phenotypic implications to really um, utilize them and apply them to, to patients. But then among the undiagnosed patients, you also have ones like these patients. Um, patient number three and patient number four both have um, lung phenotypes, such as, in, including bronchiectasis, but also sinusitis. Um, however, they're adults and they haven't been diagnosed with a genetic disease. However, if, if, you, were, if you were to genotype these individuals, you would find that one of them um, had atypical cystic fibrosis, while the other had um, two copies of a known pathogenic variant and primary ciliar dyskinesia gene. Um, because these patients have an atypical presentation, because they're adult, they don't immediately um, they don't immediately prompt a clinician to start doing genetic screening. And yet, if that genetic screening was done, then they you know we could um, they could be properly diagnosed and in some cases treated differently. Um, so on to a description of the method. Um, the method I'm going to talk about is called phenotype risk score, and the basic idea is that it leverages um, patterns of Mendelian diseases to identify patients in the, um, using uh, EHR phenotypes. So this is a clinical description from OMIM of cystic fibrosis. Like a lot of Mendelian diseases, cystic fibrosis is characterized by phenotypes that, um, that affect a number of different organ systems. Um, OMIM is a fantastic resource, and it includes thousands of these types of clinical descriptions. Um, they were initially written just in regular free text, but several years ago, the people who made human phenotype ontology mapped all of the clinical descriptions from OMIM into HPO terms. So that means that any given Mendelian disease that's described in OMIM, you can get a set of associated human phenotype ontology terms. What we did was we mapped all HPO terms that we could to something called fee codes. Fee codes are claims data, or ICD billing codes, that have been collapsed together into meaningful clinical entities um, that can be very easily extracted from the EHR. Um, and so what this series of mappings enabled us to do is to describe any given Mendelian disease in OMIM in terms of phenotypes that are very easy to extract from the EHR. Now, we've spent years doing validation work on these ICD-based phenotypes, and we've done a lot of replication studies with common variants and replicating known associations in the GWAS catalog. Um, and so they have been demonstrated to, to capture some amount of phenotypic variability in a population. And the real benefit is that they're highly portable. Even though EHR systems are all different and heterogeneous, most of them require the people who use their services to pay and ICDs are a way of, of getting that payment to happen, so they're basically ubiquitous as well. 
and we get a really broad picture of phenotypes by using phenotype or fee codes, we can get about 1,500 phenotypes out of population. And like I said, basically instantaneously, it's, it's not a heavy computational load. So what we did with these fee codes in addition to, to form the phenotype risk score is we weighted them on the log inverse prevalence um, in, in a large cohort. And that means that, that simply means that we tried to weight features that are rare and unusual like bronchiectasis more heavily than a phenotype like asthma, which is fairly common. So to apply this risk score for an individual, you look at the features that they have or fee codes that they have, and if they have a fee code, you sum up their score. If their score is high, it means that they're a decent um, match to the clinical description or a good match um, as it's presented in OMIM. If their score is zero, it means they have no clinical features that are overlapping with the disease. So the first thing that we did with the phenotype risk score is we tried to answer, um, try to make it pass sort of the, um, you know, if it could just perform a very basic function, which is could it distinguish between individuals who are clinically diagnosed with cystic fibrosis versus those who are not? And the answer is yes. If you take a group of um, patients who are diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, their phenotype risk score is about two and a half standard deviations away from what you would expect um, in a normal, healthy population. And so this demonstrates that you can differentiate a group of individuals with a diagnosis for a disease using only the features of that disease. We applied this to six different Mendelian diseases that were chosen by clinicians that were common enough that we could have enough exemplars to, to work with. Um, and it worked quite well in all cases. The one exception actually was for PKU. We hadn't thought of it but went before we selected um, uh, PKU, but that's a disease that's on the newborn screening panel. And if, if, a, per, if a baby's diagnosed with PKU and they, take a, they have proper dietary control, they don't experience any of the clinical symptoms that are described in OMIM, like intellectual disability and seizures. So we accidentally sort of recapitulated a really wonderful, what good the newborn screening tests do and how important it is to get a relevant diagnosis to patients at the right time, because these patients in general look exactly the same as healthy controls. So we didn't develop phenotype risk scores so that we could reproduce the diagnoses that clinicians already made. What we did, we developed this method in order to address the question of rare variants and ask about the phenotypic impact of rare variants. Um, several years ago, um, a cohort in BioView, which is the bio EHR-linked biobank in Vanderbilt, was genotyped on a platform called the Exome Bead Chip. The exome bead chip was an unusual chip at the time. It was designed as sort of an intermediary experiment between GWAS and whole exome sequencing, which enabled researchers to look at rare variants that hadn't been explored at scale or in GWAS very often. Um, but we didn't have the extreme expense of whole exome sequencing, which five years ago was quite a bit in particular. So, um, so we had about 30,000 individuals on this um, exome bead chip platform. And once you QC it and filter down to rare variants that are encoding regions in a European population, we had about 60,000 rare variants to look at. Using fee codes, we could ascertain, like I said, about 1,500 phenotypes. But the unfortunate thing is that we, if we were going to serially test every rare variant against every phenotype, we'd be doing about 90 million tests. And that's basically a non-starter. I mean, with that kind of correction, you're not going to be able to discover anything new. Um, and you're going to be testing things that are simply not interesting, like a variant in CFTR with foot pain. So in general, you need to be parsimonious about the, or, you know, a little bit more frugal with the number of tests that you perform, especially when you're dealing with rare variants, which are hard to study because by definition you have very little information um, associated with any individual variant. So what we did is we leveraged the amazing resource that is OMIM to form hypotheses that we could test so we could scale down the search space. Um, and we did that by creating a general hypothesis, which is that if a variant in a particular gene is linked to a phenotypic pattern, then other variants in that same gene will produce a similar pattern. And by doing this, we took our 60,000 variants, filtered it down to 13,000 that occurred in Mendelian disease-causing genes, and then we further filtered it down by these diseases that were amenable to the phenotype risk score method. In order to get a good profile using phenotype risk score, you need to have a, a few, at least three features. That was at least what we somewhat arbitrarily to admit. We, 
chose at least three features in order to be profilable. So there are a lot of Mendelian diseases that have only one feature associated with them, like diseases that are characterized by long QT interval. We, we can't create profiles for that. So we had 6,644 variants that we looked at overall. And when we applied them to the exome bead chip data, we found a number of significant associations. I'm not going to, to discuss um, the specifics of, of these, um, but I encourage, if you're interested in these results, to, we put out a paper in, I think, April or March about phenotype risk score. Um, and you can read about all of the stuff that we did there. We did some replication work, which went very well. We did some whole exo exome sequencing that was targeted and some wet lab work as well. Um, but by generating this data, we were able to actually add information about what is known about these variants um, from a population-based um, cohort. And um, the, type of the type of information that a phenotype risk score can generate actually fits, I think, really nicely into the ACMG guidelines of, um, of uh, cor finding correlation between phenotype and genotype. So that information that's generating using this method may be able to be put into context of other types of information to help interpret variants. The second application I want to mention is um, work that we do with the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Um, for those who are not familiar, the Undiagnosed Disease Network enrolls patients who, um, for whom clinicians believe may have a Mendelian disease but haven't been diagnosed. Um, patients who are enrolled and accepted into the program are phenotyped using human, human on phenotype ontology terms, which is excellent for us because we can really rapidly create a phenotype that is based on the proband. What we do then is um, we get a list of candidate variants um, from the UDN um, net, uh, physicians as well. And when we have genotype information that's available in the exome B chip, which occurs roughly 15% of the time, we're able to ask, are people in BioView, in our biobank, who have the same genotype as the proband, do they look similar to the proband? Are they enriched for the features of the proband? So we produce a score that looks like this. Um, typically, and most, most of the time, the useful information that we can provide to the UDN network is that there's usually a handful of variants that are very unlikely to underlie the, the proband's disease because we have an abundance of healthy-looking individuals in, in BioView, or may, if, if they're not healthy, they at least are not suffering from similar, um, a similar-looking disease. Um, but occasionally, we get good candidates as well, and two of those candidates have actually ultimately been um, found to be un underlying the, the proband's disease. Finally, I want to touch on the idea of um, finding undiagnosed patients. Um, so when we applied this method to variant interpretation, we started with genotype information. We split up the population. We looked at people who had these rare genetic variants and then asked if they were different from the rest of the population. Um, but the success of that variant interpretation process made us think, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could kind of reverse this and start with an entire clinical population and find individuals who are likely to be impacted by a Mendelian disease? Um, and I find this to be a very exciting idea um, because although I don't know how many people are undiagnosed and, and are um, impacted by a Mendelian disease, I think any clinician agrees that, that the knowledge of pathogenic variants that we have right now isn't perfectly and uniformly applied across the clinical population, that these patients do exist. The issue with, so I'm just going to kind of speak philosophically about this because I don't have data yet to address how well this kind of method works or what is actually needed in order to make this work. But anybody who's going to try to find undiagnosed patients is going to find themselves in what I call the valley of improbability. Um, if you take any random patient and test them for a random Mendelian disease, your prior probability of getting a positive test is very, 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 very low. And so in order to climb out of that low valley of improbability, you need to have information that's going to make that patient be set apart from the rest of the population. And the thing is that any one um, disease, there are a lot of pathways to get there. Somebody could be in a really terrible tra um, traffic accident and be paralyzed from the neck down. And it's difficult to actually contextualize the phenotypes that you extract from, from the EHR. But we're working on ways of combining the phenotype risk score with other types of EHR-based resources to do just that. The one thing I will say is that 
um, based on the research that we've done, I think that it's really important if you're going to be looking for people who could be diagnosed with a Mendelian disease but are not, I think it's really important to think about leveraging all of the knowledge that's been generated so far about these Mendelian genes um, instead of doing a completely agnostic approach. In general, I have a lot of questions that I'm interested in and I'm learning a lot about as I, I'm here at this conference about the utility of this type of, um, this type of method. Um, where would it be most helpful to apply? What are the problems that, that exist right now and barriers to clinical implementation that this could help with? And I also think that there are some really interesting questions to, that we should address about exactly where these undiagnosed patients are, what diseases are most likely to be undiagnosed in a clinic, um, and, and, and for that, I don't, I don't really have any, necessarily any answers, but I'm interested in, in anybody who wants to discuss that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are uniformly really excellent, and that's it. Thanks so much. Um, any quick questions? Okay, we will um, continue that in the discussion. So next up is um, Mark Williams, um, implement Implementation in a Learning Healthcare System. <laughs>